friends, especially my brothers and sisters in Christ, many in our church family, as Chuck said this morning, are in pain as we share the grief of one of our families and the sudden loss they're experiencing. The loss is heartbreaking and devastating. It's a reality that's become too prevalent in our society today. It's a harsh reminder of the pain and brokenness that exists in this world. It's my desire this morning that by turning to the Word of God, we can find comfort and hope in the midst of our sorrow. During times like these, we need to come together as a family of believers to diligently seek our Lord for guidance, to grieve and to support one another, to understand how to come alongside, to love, and to minister to those who are hurting. This is not a time to think about what I could have done or what I should have done, but what is the Lord calling me to do now? In a world filled with chaos, suffering, and sin, it's natural for us to feel overwhelmed and hopeless. There are people you are sitting near right now at this moment who have fears about tomorrow, uncertainties that are weighing them down, and even in a room full of people are feeling very alone. Please don't assume that because they came this morning, they have it all together. Many people are searching for hope in lots of places, but I'm here to tell you that there is only one true source of hope, and that's the Word of God. You know what's sad about that? It's sad that so many people cry out to God for answers, yet they neglect to read the Bible, His Word, which is the primary source of His guidance. Why is it that we often expect God to provide us with answers to difficulties, hardships, and anguish that we encounter, yet we fail to read his words? Oh, there's lots of excuses. Lack of time. My life is busy. Have you seen my schedule? I want to do it, but oh my goodness, the time to sit down and read the Bible is difficult. Maybe it's confusion about the content. You know, when I try and read the Bible, there are so many parts I don't understand. How about feeling overwhelmed by the length? The Bible is a long book. I mean, someone told me that it actually has 66 books. I'm not sure if I've read that many books in my life. And besides, the idea of reading it from cover to cover can be daunting. Or maybe just lack of interest. Some people may simply not be interested in reading the Bible. Or the perception of the Bible is outdated and irre irrelevant. In today's secular society, many, if not most, view the Bible as obsolete and inconsequential. But what so many people don't realize is that the Bible is filled with the very promises of hope that they're crying for. And it tells us that we can have that hope even in the darkest of times. In Romans 15:4. It says, for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. The scriptures are not only a source of instruction, but also a source of encouragement that can sustain us in the face of trials and tribulations. Moreover, the Bible teaches us that our hope is not in this world, but in the world to come. In Colossians 1.5, it says, Hope stored up for you, where? In heaven. This hope is not something that is dependent on our circumstances or the state of the world we live in today. It is a hope that is secure and unwavering, grounded in the promises of God. Furthermore, the Bible teaches us that our hope is in Christ Jesus, who is the anchor of our soul. Hebrews 6.19 says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Each of us needs to remember that Christ is the one who gives us hope, and in him we can find rest and peace for our weary souls. You may have heard that we are to fix our eyes on Christ and the promises of God's word and to hold fast to the hope that we have in him. So, where do we find that? Let's look in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 
In verse 18, it tells us, fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And then again in Hebrews, it says, fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer or founder and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. As we face the evils of this world, let's remember the words of the Apostle Paul. In Romans 12, 12, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. It's in keeping our eyes on Jesus that we are able to rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, and be constant in prayer so that we, through him, can overcome the world. In the book of Matthew, we have a good example of the importance of keeping our eyes on Jesus. When we read how Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. Just think about that picture for a moment. The only way he could come toward Jesus is he had to be looking at Jesus to see where he was. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink, crying out, Lord, save me. I want you to open your Bible this morning to John's Gospel, chapter 16. Now, Pastor Stuckey has been walking us through this Gospel, and I cer certainly can't improve on the portions we've covered so far. So I want to jump far ahead so that when he does cover this section, it will hopefully reinforce what we're hearing this morning, or better yet, that it will provide even greater insight when he shares the principles he brings from scriptures. Now, before we look at the text itself, starting in verse 25, let me state the obvious. The world in which we live is bleak and filled with fearful people who are struggling to make some sense out of life. Their fears are personal, private, individual, but they are also collective. So where's our hope? It's not enough that we have trouble of our own. The media bombards us with numerous issues that are not necessarily ours to deal with. And as a result, we're burdened with a massive accumulation of complex and challenging problems that each person is told that they must care about and deal with in their daily lives. Again, where's our hope? Some have taken what I call the digital drug. You can see those addicted to it as you move throughout your day. It's consumed by people of all ages. The digital screen has replaced connecting with the world around you, interacting face to face with others, truly taking the time to listen to the words they have to say. I mean, when someone passes you in the hall and they say, hey, how's it going? Are they really expecting you to answer? Just this week, I watched a man whose face was buried in the digital device in his hand, walk in front of a line of cars without ever looking up. Are you sitting, and maybe you're sitting in that chair saying to yourself, whew, wow, I'm glad that's not me. Well, let me ask you, if you left the house this morning, drove for about five minutes, and then realized you left your Bible at home, would you turn around and go get it? How about your phone? But it's not just the digital devices that distract us. There are so many other distractions that are constantly vying for our attention. And because of it, we've lost the ability to build strong, lasting relationships. So many struggle to confront the challenges we face today alone and without the support of those around them. Where is our hope? Families are experiencing high levels of turmoil and breakups. On top of this, society has been promoting self-esteem and individual pride, which has led people becoming more self-centered and focused solely on their own desires. If all I care about is me and what I want and what I own, then it becomes nearly impossible to, to establish meaningful connections with others. The more things we possess, the more things occupy us, the less significant our relationships become. Where is our hope? 
Let me try to answer that question. At the core of every human lies an irreducible need for three fundamental realities. These three are the essential minimum, yet they also represent the utmost requirements for human existence. First and foremost, people require love. They must be loved, and this love must be given unconditionally, lavishly, and generously. They need someone who knows all of their faults and shortcomings, yet loves them in spite of the flaws. The second reality that people desperately require is someone they can trust and believe, someone they can have faith in. They require someone who is wholly devoted to their welfare, someone who can secure their lives in the midst of an insecure world. This person must possess great power and generosity with the necessary resources to care for them and rescue them from all their troubles. They need someone who can provide the strength and protection they need to face all of life's challenges. And lastly, people require hope the assurance that there is a future beyond their present circumstances. They need to see a light at the end of the ever-darkening tunnel and to know that there is a plan and purpose behind their existence. They must believe that something good awaits them in the future, surpassing any of the negative experiences that currently occupy their lives. A hope that provides the fuel to persevere through the darkest of times and overcome all obstacles. Did you catch those three realities? Love, faith, and hope. Someone to love, someone you can trust to care for, to deliver you, to lift you up above your problems, and someone to give you a future. Love, faith, and hope. Sound familiar? That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul, Paul the Apostle in 1 Corinthians 13 says there are these three, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Listen to how Paul leads us up to this list, this list of three essentials. If I speak in the tongue of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have the faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away childhood things behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. For those of us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, these three divine provisions are the essential ingredients for living a life of peace and joy. Now, it's, an, it's important to understand the difference between peace and joy and the Christian life. While both are precious gifts that flow from my relationship with God through faith in Jesus, they are distinct in their nature and purpose. Peace is a state of tranquility and calmness that transcends, transcends circumstances in life. It's the assurance that we've been reconciled to God through Christ and that nothing can separate us from his love. It enables us to approach life with a sense of stability and confidence, even in the midst of trials and tribulations. The Hebrew word for peace is shalom, which means completeness, soundness, and well-being. 
Shalom is not just the absence of conflict or trouble, but it is the presence of wholeness and harmony. The New Testament, in the New Testament, the Greek word for peace is irene, refers to the state of rest and quietness. Philippians 4, 7 describes this peace as surpassing all understanding, and it will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Jesus himself said in John 14, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Again, in John 16, he said, have I told you these things? So I have told you these things so that in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Now, joy, on the other hand, is a deep sense of gladness or delight that comes from knowing and experiencing the goodness of God. It is not dependent upon our external circumstances, but rather is rooted in a relationship with God. Joy is often mentioned in the Bible as the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and it is something that believers can experience even in the midst of trials and difficulties. For example, James 1, in verse 2 and 3, It says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. So while peace and joy are related and often experienced together, peace emphasizes the absence of conflict, excuse me, peace emphasizes the absence of conflict and turmoil, while joy emphasizes the presence of gladness and delight in God. As such, they are a powerful source of strength and resilience that enables us to persevere through trials and tribulations and to approach each day with a spirit of gratitude and hope. Now, as we get ready to look at John 16, our Lord is providing some instructions and some encouragement to his 11 disciples. The words that he gave them on that Thursday night of Passion Week, the night before his crucifixion, started in chapter 13, and they run all the way down to the end of chapter 16. And as he talked with them, he made them all kinds of promises, but he also gave them all kinds of warnings. But what they hear is that he keeps talking about dying and leaving. And because of that, they are full of anxiety. While he has been with them, they, uh, they had someone to love them. While he's been with them, they had someone to believe in who had delivered them from every issue and provided everything they needed. And while he's been with them, he has filled their lives with hope. But now he's talking about leaving and dying. In addition to that, he told them, you're going to be persecuted the same way I'm being persecuted. You're going to be hated, resented, rejected. And this is going to go on through all of human history to all the followers of Christ. He says in Luke 21, they're going to turn against you, brother against brother, family member against family member. Society is going to turn against you, and they're even going to kill you and will think they're doing God's service in doing so. It's not going to go well for you. Why are they going to hate you? Because they hate me. Because you're not part of the world system, and they resent those who aren't. Because they don't know God, and they are followers of Satan. This is a bleak moment for the disciples. Jesus is talking about dying, talking about leaving, and he tells them it's going to get far worse for them and for us. And why is he telling them this? Chapter 16, verse 1 says, All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. So as he closes out the evening, they are profoundly troubled. Several times in this text, John notes that their hearts were deeply troubled. So as the Lord closes in verses 25 through 33, he offers them comfort, and the comfort he offers is built around these three realities. You have one who loves you. You have one who can be trusted with your life and time and eternity. And you have one who has a plan, who has planned a hope for you. Faith, hope, and love then dominate this final section. You wouldn't necessarily see that until you dig down a little bit in the text. So let's begin reading in verse 25. Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use that kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. 
In that day you will ask in my name. I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your, on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered this world. Now I'm leaving the world and going back to the Father. Then Jesus' disciples said, Well, now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. Do you now believe, Jesus replied? A time is coming, in fact has come, when you will be scattered, each to your own home. You will leave me all alone. Yet I'm not alone, for the Father is with me. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. How can they have peace in the face of all of this? How can they have peace in the face of Jesus dying and leaving? How can they have peace in the face of persecution and even execution? Look at verse 33, the last statement, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. Now take heart, that seems like a pretty weak response, maybe like some kind of pep talk. You may have had people tell you in the midst of your worst fears, anxieties, disappointments, distress, and trouble, take heart, you know, cheer up. And sometimes you want to reach right out and whack them. <laughs> because it's obvious that they don't even understand the depth of your problem with such a superficial answer. They have no comprehension of the pain you're going through. But there is one who does. When Jesus says, take heart, that's a different issue. As a Christian, we are to listen to, believe in, and take action because of his command to take heart in our sinful world. We do this by placing our trust in God and relying on his strength. We find courage through prayer, reading the Bible, and fellowship with other believers. We should also remind ourselves that Christ has overcome the world and that we have victory through him. Additionally, we can find encouragement in the examples of faithful Christians who have gone before us and persevered through difficult times. One of my favorite verses, Hebrews 12, 1 through 2, reminds us that we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Hallelujah. By focusing on God's promises and relying on his grace, we can take courage and face the challenges of our sinful world with hope and faith. If the Lord Jesus, who is in control of absolutely everything, says, take heart, Let's remember these three things. One, you are loved by God. Two, you are in God's everlasting care. And three, God has a promise for your future. If you desire peace that surpasses all understanding, even in the midst of trials and tribul tribulations, and if you long for joy that cannot be shaken by the troubles of life, then you must find your refuge in the arms of a loving God. This God is the one whom you have entrusted your eternal soul and who cares for you deeply, even when you doubt. Not only does he have the power to govern the present, but he also holds the future in his hands and has already planned your place in it, an inheritance that is incorruptible undefiled, and reserved in heaven for you. Think about it. God loves you. God holds you. And he has an unshakable purpose in eternity for you. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you and give thanks for the time we've spent studying this text. We acknowledge that there is so much more to learn and explore, but you've given us enough, 
I pray this morning to stir our hearts with gratitude for your provision. Even in the midst of darkness, just as the disciples experienced, we can find a path to peace and joy by knowing that we are loved by the God of the universe. We can trust that you will care for us for all eternity and that nothing can separate us from your loving grasp, even in our times of doubt and struggle. We have the promise of an overcoming future, a triumph of hope, a kingdom that is both present and yet to come, the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the great promise of the gospel for all who turn to you in faith. May we embrace these truths with joy and gratitude in our hearts. And we pray all of this in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.